Welcome everyone to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar series. My name is Matt Balfoff. I'm the director of the center and a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering. To learn more about the center, please visit our website. We encourage you to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, a little bit more about us. So we are a group of um, principal investigators and faculty at the University of Texas at Austin. We do a, uh, research in a number of different areas, including a number of subsurface applications, some in conventional and unconventional oil and gas, but also a number of other subsurface applications. We have a large variety of technical disciplines and we use many different engineering tools to solve these problems. We collaborate with industry in a lot of different ways. One of those is with our industrial affiliate programs. I've listed a few here. Our monthly webinar series is, as you know, is informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. They're hosted the second Tuesday of the month uh, normally via Teams. All webinars are uploaded to our YouTube channel within a few days, although we encourage you to attend live so that you could uh, ask questions and participate. Uh, our next webinar will be next month on Tuesday, July 12th, and it's tentatively going to be Hugh Daigle and Arvind Ravikumar on net zero and sustainability. Um, and uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to remind you that you can post your questions in the Q&A section, and we encourage you to do that um, as soon as you have the questions. So it'll appear there, and then uh, our speaker will answer questions at the very end, but it's best if um, the questions are are waiting uh, for the speaker when that comes. But um, I do would like to introduce our speaker. We have a very, um, uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Mary Wheeler talk about the dynamic adaptability, adaptivity for coupled flow and geomechanics and unconventional reservoirs. Uh, Mary doesn't need much of an introduction, but um, she's an expert in, comp in computational science. She's been a member of the uh, faculty at the University of Texas at Austin since 1995, and she's the director of the Center for Subsurface Modeling at the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering Sciences. She has won uh, too many awards for me to mention here, but um, I'll list a few. Uh, she was elected to the National Academy of Engineering um, in 1998. In 2006 and in 2008, she received honorary doctorates. And in 2009, she was honored with the Cyan Geoscience Career Prize. More recently, um, in 2014, she was awarded an honorary member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. And um, in 2020, she received the Billy and Claude Hocott Distinguished Centennial Engineering Research Award at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, so with that, um, I'll pass it over to Mary. Matt, thank you for such a nice <clears throat> introduction, and I want to uh, thank the uh, CSEE for allowing me to make this presentation. This really represents uh, a lot of work that has been done uh, by my graduate students and uh, several people that we have collaborated with. Uh, in particular, what I want to talk about is this dynamic adaptivity for coupled flow and geomechanics in unconventional reservoirs. Uh, my group has spent uh, considerable time involved in doing phase field coupled with uh, flow and mechanics, and also we've done a lot of work on doing carbon storage. And so what we want to look at in this presentation is I want to go over a brief summary of work we have previously done on phase field uh, for doing energy uh, minimization and look at uh, hydraulic fracturing, as well as some of our work on carbon storage. And to use that as uh, some of the current motivation for work in particular for doing some dynamic adaptivity for coupling poor mechanics and flow, how to do error estimators for being able to change the mesh 
And in particular, when we talk about uh, a posteriori error estimates, what we're really discussing here are bounds that we use for comparing the true solution of the problem uh, to uh, the computational co uh, computational results that you have. So these are upper and lower bounds that help us to be able to decide how accurate are our results. Uh, this is so very different than trying to run one uh, simulation and then have the mesh using comparing with manufactured solutions. It's something about how we can monitor the solution as we are running. So one, doing a posteriori error estimates is one of the issues that we're going to discuss today. Another is a concept known as space-time adaptivity. In other words, we want to change the mesh both in space and time. So when we want to have a refinement, we're going to do it locally, both in state, space and in time. Uh, this is a new concept and seems to work well for uh, treating uh, black law models, uh, for example. But one, it is computationally uh, complex and developing, but I will point out one place where this is currently being used in terms of trying to uh, look at improving snapshots when you're looking at POD approximations. And then I'll end with conclusions and future work. All right, we start out with what is phase field function. Uh, here I show in these cartoons a real fracture, fracture, an interface approach, and here is this phase field variable which says phi outside the fracture, phi is one, phi inside the fracture is zero, and then you have this green-yellow region where phi varies between zero and one. This latter picture, uh, C, really represents a diffusive approach for using phase field. And then you see the cartoon on the right, which shows between the fracture and the reservoir, we have this epsilon. Well, we have, uh, there is <clears throat> a number of papers that have been involved in the development of variational methods based on energy minimization. And I include the classical theory of fracture propagation uh, diffusive crack zones for discontinuity problems, geomechanics modeling, uh, phase field for fractures, and then of course where I've worked with Andro Mischlich, Thomas Wick, and Son Hyun Lee on using fracture, hydraulic fracture, and porous media. And you see on the right there's this energy functional, it's the a uh, linear elasticity equation, which has been uh, treated uh, by adding uh, this K to stabilize the solution. Also, we use for the flow part, uh, what we call a diffraction process, whereby you're talking about flow in the fracture and flow in the reservoir. Uh, this I've shown this in the case of single phase flow with coupled with linear elasticity, but we have also extended this to look at two phase flow. Uh, here are some examples of the phase field. This gives you some of the techniques. Then notice that in this approach, I want to point out uh, we're coupling mechanics flow and phase field. But here, we, the stress intensity factors and remeshing along the crack path are embedded in the model. Another example is in the case of the stress shadow effects, uh, one using phase field. These are two examples that show some of the previous work we have done in this area. Uh, again, doing, working with propa transport and a fracture, and then also admissible displacement are examples. 
uh, associated with this previous work that we've done in, uh, on phase field. What I want to look at for the future are the tools for addressing this growing interest in modeling hydrogen storage and also continuing work on carbon storage. Uh, it's been told or said that hydrogen could fulfill 18% of total energy demand by 2050. But major challenges in implementing a full hydrogen economy is in, is in storage. So one, what we need to do, what are goals, develop guidelines, lines to select storage sites based on numerical studies of several depleted oil and gas reservoirs and saline aquifers, identify impact parameters for efficient cyclic storage to ensure readiness of our physical and numerical models. And the modeling requirements really involve multi-phase flow, stress changes, microbial activity, geochemistry, hydrogeology, and geomechanics. A lot of physics and chemistry and biology in these models is needed. So what our approach is to develop new high fidelity algorithms based on, as I mentioned earlier, a posteriori error estimates and our previous work on carbon storage, fracture mechanics, multi-phase flow and geomechanics. So we're gonna need new models for addressing these issues. So let me, with respect to my talk, go through some of the motivations and what we want to do in developing these models. So in particular, if you look at what we're talking about is coupling multi-physics and multi-scale for porous media. So we need to preserve the physics, the chemistry and biology across scales. So we need energy and mass volume conservation. We also need to be able to treat temporal and spatial scales, convergence and stability, contraction in particular, one, solving all of this physics, chemistry, and biology monolithically is beyond our computational capabilities today. So we need to be looking at decoupling algorithms and also being at adaptivity of mesh. So high performance computing, adaptive mesh ref refinement, and of course, all of you that have worked in reservoir simulation know that solvers are so critical in these computational efforts. In addition, data extraction, optimization, uncertainty quantification, and machine learning need to be incorporated whenever we can. So our objectives in this work has been the modeling and simulation technology that requires the knowledge of mathematics, computer science, engineering, and the domain sciences. Our research goal is to revolutionize simulation by creating high fidelity models, algorithms, and technologies for complex multi-physics, multi-scale, and stochastic problems, and to apply them toward the solution of realistic applications. So let me begin with some background. One area that has really been very active in the petroleum industry is in the coupling techniques. Uh, this goes back to the work of Satari and his collaborators, Rick Dean and his collaborators. And also I list to uh, a former student of mine, Julie Gay at Exxon Production Research, and I guess it's Exxon Mobil now, excuse me and Kim, who was at Stanford. And so in these coupling schemes, people have looked at both fully implicit coupling, which is stable, accurate, but requires dedicated simulator and a monolithic solver. It's very complicated to develop. Loose or explicit coupling is fast, but less accurate and only empirical and heuristic estimates are used. But then there came of this combination of iterative coupling, decoupling the flow and the mechanics. And there is the stability analysis of Kim, the contraction mapping that I <clears throat> developed with Andro Mischlich, 
and also with Giraud, uh, Vivette Giraud and Kunin Karmar. Also, there have been specialized discretization methods, preconditioners, and then more recent work on a priori error estimates for poor elastic systems. This has been useful, as you'll see later in some of our APA story results. The three-way coupling with fixed stress, which was introduced by Dean, and which actually uh, Gay has used, applied, and I will show you some applications where this really uh, has a uh, mathematical rigor behind it, plus how useful it can be when you're looking at some of these uh, very complicated physics problems. And then more recently, this APA story error estimates for poor elastic elastic systems by fixed stress. This is work that one um, <clears throat> has been developed with uh, Vivette Giraud, Lou, and uh, myself. And then this was done uh, as when another uh, work in this area for mixed method has, will appear in, in uh, print uh, shortly. So what is fixed stress for poor elastic elastic coupling? Well, in the time step you have, you're at time t n plus one, you want to do a new fixed stress iteration L. So you solve for a pressure, assuming that the uh, fixed stress is fixed. And then you compute, you solve for the displacement and the pressure as an external load. And then when computes a new <coughs> fixed stress uh, approximation, followed by a fluid fraction. If the fluid fraction, relative error of the fluid fraction is sufficiently small, you go on, you increase the time step. Otherwise, you go through and do another stress iteration. Well, I don't want to go through all the details, but what I want you to observe here, that if you take the time step is sufficiently small, it's bounded by these physics parameters. If it satisfies that condition, that inequality, then one has optimal rates of convergence for the uh, BO system. Now, what is three-way coupling? This was, as said, introduced by Rick Dean a number of years ago, and so, but what he observed is that you could do fixed stress, but you could also extrapolate the velocity, you could extrapolate the displacement, or you could do explicit coupling. So he had a way of breaking this uh, technique up. Well, with uh, Cherry Lou, one of my graduate students, we actually showed that the convergence of this three-way coupling is a, can be established by using these a priori results that we proved earlier. So basically, there's two convergence criteria, as you can see in the flow chart on the right, that if you satisfy one inequality that says, OK, uh, then let me just cal uh, calculate the, um, uh, I want to calculate the mean stress, and I have if it is uh, A, sufficiently small, then I can use the extrapolated velocity or, I, I mean, extrapolated displacements, or I can just do explicit coupling. Well, anyhow, let's see how well does this work. We take Mandel's problem, which is one of the problems for which we can compute the exact solution. If you look at the plots on the left. We have a blue plot shows fixed stress. The red shows three-way coupling. So the three-way coupling reduces. If I can use the three-way coupling, I can reduce the total uh, percentage of mechanics linear iterations by 70%. The plot on the right really shows that in this simulation, I look at the accumulated time steps for each displacement update scheme. So we out of 2000 steps, 8.8% used fixed stress, the iterative coupling. 
22% used explicit coupling and 71.4% of the total time steps use the extrapolated displacement values without solving the geomechanics equation. So you can really cut the cost of adding the mechanics to the flow substantially. All right, I wanna give some more realistic examples of where this has been applied. That was a manufacturer, that was really taking a known solution. We use as our simulation work cars, I cars, it has compositional, black oil, single, two phase. It does poroelastic elastic and even has done work in poroplasticity. plasticity. We have reactive transport, ASP flooding. Uh, there's some uh, 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 advanced petrophysics. Uh, for example, uh, this foam has been added. Uh, we have hysteretic capability. And also there is for history matching, uncertainty quantification and optimization. We can do different geometries and we have different solvers and so forth and so on. And so here it's three phases, NC components. We do a flash. It's a full compositional model. Uh, hydrocarbons are fully compressible. Water is slightly compressible. So here is your mass conservation of component I, and so we list all the different unknowns. So one, what I wanted to do was to explain how some of this fixed stress and three-way coupling works when we look at more realistic examples. And so what we did was to look at a compositional Cranfell model for CO2 storage. And what I won't go through all the details, but this was data that we took from Canf Cranfield. So this is fairly realistic data, field data. So here it is if we did continuous CO2 injection. For CO2 concentration during a 20 year CO2 sequestration solved by the fixed stress split, the one on the right is the three way coupling. You can't really when you eyeball it, look, they look ex exactly the same. Uh, and if you look at specific uh, applications like pressure, vertical displacement, gas saturation, uh, you see that the curves, the data, the fixed stress and the three-way set right on top of the solutions. Three-way coupling reduced by roughly 85% of the overall CPU time compared to the fixed stress. Specifically, the mechanics model runtime is reduced substantially by 99.4%. And, and again, you can see that in the fixed stress, total CPU time, 60 hours versus three-way coupling of nine hours. Now here is, for example, a more interesting problem where we're using surfactant alternating gas. And so on the left, it's the fixed stress, and on the right, it's solved by three-way coupling. And again, by similar results, three-way coupling reduces 78.2% time compared to fixed stress coupling. And the mechanics model runtime is reduced substantially by 97.5%. And you can see again that the solutions comparisons at a grid point that are virtually the same. Now, what that came up with one approach, you don't need to solve the mechanics problem at every time step, that if you're careful in how you can do this, even in the case of a compositional model, that one can substantially reduce the computational time. And that's going to be needed if we're going to be looking at issues, for example, like doing more carbon storage or looking at, in particular, uh, adding, looking at hydrogen. So here, one, what I'm talking about is uh, where we saw the flow equation by the enriched Galerkin method. This is a simplified discontinuous Galerkin method. Simply, you do continuous Galerkin, but then add piecewise discontinuous constants so that you get local mass conservation. 
uh, this approach is very useful in particular uh, if one is going to look at doing geothermal issues because in particular here you have the flow now you need also energy and so coupling the flow and the energy you have both the ability to have mass conservation but also you have the ability to handle the upwinding more accurately in particular for the case of if you're uh, going to be looking at uh, transport either propane transport or transport in energy now what we're doing in these opistory results we're going to look at residual based opistory error estimates and we're going to establish these lower and upper bounds so you're going to get in your solution which you don't know the answer to you're going to get these bounds that will allow you to detect are you converging or not so if you look at this on this reliability error bound here we're writing this for pressure for stresses for the divergence of the um, uh, volumetric strain and also pressure and so what one has shown what we've shown is that these error bounds are bounded by initial error indicators initial error data error and then i'm going to go over some of these terms which may look complicated but they're not but in particular you have the algorithmic fixed stress error indicator that's the algorithmic error error that we get when we do the splitting between the flow and the mechanics when we're solving the flow equation we have time errors, we have flow errors, and because one, either if you're using a mixed method or in particular if you're using enriched Galerkin, you have uh, jumps that you need to compute. Then there are the mechanics error indicators that involve stress tensors, time derivative, errors in the stress tensor at final time, the errors and displacements, time derivative, the errors and the displacement final term. Now let me point out all these indicators only involve values that are already computed. You don't need to do any additional computation. They are there for you to one use. So we calculate the pressure displacement solutions or at the current time step or at previous time step and previous fixed stress iteration. No reconstruction or solving auxiliary equations is needed. Again, I don't want to go through, but here is Mandel's problem. Uh, all individual indicators demonstrate second order convergence, except for the algorithmic error, which is very small. And so one, the square root of flow and mechanics exhibit the second same order of convergence as the errors leading to convergence effectively indices. So here's some examples. Uh, for example, with a, uh, uh, we calculate a local discretization error indicator for each element, sum up the normalized flow error indicators. And then what we do is we take the top 10% of the errors with the largest refinement indicator and refine them isotropically. The bottom 20% errors elements with the smallest refinement indicator are coarsened. So we're in this process of dynamically changing. And so here you can see an example where we have a fracture and we have this uh, well, the mesh is adaptively fine near the well across the fractures at fracture joints and around fracture tips. As the fluid is being depleted inside the fractures, more refinements are put inside and across the fracture. So again, one looks at, uh, for example, like the flow, if you used uniform mesh versus the mechanics if you use. And so we keep roughly 15% uh, of the era 15% of the mesh is really for the uh, refinements and 20% roughly for the uh, uh, the 
uh, in other words, 15 and 20 percent vary uh, on the flow in the mechanics as indicated in the table. And also we have a st novel stopping criteria for fixed stress. It turns out in fixed stress uh, that that's already so accurate that it is sufficient to even reduce the uh, scenarios, reduce the epsilon. You only use uh, a percentage when you compute this error bound. So the error, error caused by fixed stress split is an order of magnitude less than the errors caused by spatial and temporal discretization. And here's some more uh, results with respect to the accuracy. They are practically on top of each other. And uh, one, when we're doing this splitting, you might ask how many iterations? and they usually are somewhere between one and three iterations if you follow these criteria. So let me summarize a little bit on the CO2 carbon storage here. Uh, omitting relative permeability hysteresis really significantly underestimates carbon storage during the water alternating gas or the SAG. I didn't discuss this in detail, but clearly our model has hysteresis. Uh, using SAG increases CO2 storage and oil recovery significantly during carbon sequestration and EOR processes. Um, and these conclusions are things that we did in all of our models over time. We also used uh, a UT optimization uh, optimizers with a genetic algorithm for inverse modeling, and we came up with some very nice results about uh, optimizing the SAG results. But the important point is the last one is that the coupled compositional flow and poral elastic simulator provides a powerful tool useful for analyzing cap rock integrity. So we feel that this work today that we've done on carbon storage, it'd be very useful in trying to exploit this more for hydrogen. So let me go quickly through space-time discretization. This is an area that I think has tremendous promise for doing multi-phase flow and multi-scale problems. These are computationally challenged. Nonlinear convergence of models with multi-scale grid is impacted by the finest scale. So what we do is we see that the largest nonlinear residual exists at the water saturation front. Only the front region requires small time steps to guarantee Newton convergence. I don't know how many of you that have run reservoir simulators and you keep reducing the time step. I don't want to reduce the time step. I only want what you're seeing is that you only need to reduce the time step in a small portion of the domain. So basically, what do you do in space time domain decomposition? You apply fine time steps only in the front regions, while the rest uses coarse time steps. You deploy, you deploy spatial mesh of different scales to represent features in the system. What we have done here is to use the enhanced velocity at space-time interfaces and solve the system implicitly. The enhanced velocity is a nice way of doing adaptivity using the mixed finite element method. If you look at the algorithmic details, we start with solving each space-time domain in the coarsest resolution. Then we refine to the finest time scale in regions indicated by the error estimators. We excuse me, freeze the temporal mesh and refine spatially in regions with large error estimation and saturation gradient. After each refinement, provide the initial guess for the linear, temporal, and spatial interpolation from the previous solution. And then we restore the domain to the coarsest resolution and start a new time step. So let's see, here is a semi-structured grid that we use, and here you see the local refinement one. And so again, we have error estimates. We have derived through residual estimator, flux estimators, 
And what we call, because it's a mixed method, you have non-conforming estimators. So the, I won't go through these error estimators, but this is what we use to tell when are we going to refine and how much. And so here is the top part involves temporal res residual estimators, the bottom, the temporal flux estimators. Uh, and uh, then here, let's take an example. Uh, and here is uh, for Gaussian permeability. This is comes from the SPE 10 model layer 20. And so one here we have the fine scale permeability, fine scale porosity. And then you see X and Y permeability at different levels, at level zero, at level one, and level two. You can see how we're getting a better approximation to the permeability in these cases. And let's see how there is the adaptive water saturation and below it is the fine scale saturation. So the finest mesh outlines the water saturation front. And here is one again showing saturation profiles and you see adaptive mesh at 100 days and at 500 days and you can see these different models. And again, the runtime improvement. Uh, one, the point to note about this chart or this slide is that 25 times speed up in solving the linear system when using the iterative solver. Uh, again, we match production history. You could say, can you match this? The production rate of both phases matches well between the adaptive and fine scale. Cumulative production curves are almost identical. Now, what about channelized permeability? This is certainly much interesting. And again, you can see that you have in the channelized fine scale, there's the permeability at level zero and a level one and a level two. We're getting a better approximation at each of these levels to the permeability. And then here again, dynamic saturation profile, the adaptive, and you can see how you adapt uh, and the fine scale that looks very much alike, but much less uh, computation component. So channelized permeability, again, one, uh, subdomains with both feces type are refined until only one is present. So let's see uh, here again, the saturation looks similar to the fine scale. So you can see these different uh, computational results when we're doing adaptivity versus the fine scale. Again, production history, the smoother oil rate at early time it was smoother the oil rate at early time and slightly early water breakthrough. breakthrough. And again, runtime improvement result. Now, uh, here's Gaussian like her black oil. Now here we're doing a three phase. And you can see the adaptive grid and you can see the adaptive saturation and fine water saturation. And then here one sees it in doing channelized permeability. So let me sp state, what about the space time summary? Approximately 25 times speed up when using sequential refinement solver as compared to solving the fine scale solution. Uh, we have more details going production rates, cumulative recoveries, and saturation profile and Gaussian-like permeability look identical between adaptive and fine. The adaptive solution from the channelized permeability is more accurate during most period with smoother oil rate at early time and slight early water breakthrough. What I think is really interesting here in the space time is not that we're going Company X, Y, and Z is not going to be developing a new space time reservoir simulator. But what we're seeing that this can be useful 
is space time can be utilized in selection of snapshots for uh, POD simulations. When you want to do reduced order modeling and you're trying to come up with a surrogate, that one, you can run the space time model to really come up with more accurate snapshots. It's, this is one of the my PhD students that is working on this and hopes to be finishing soon. But anyhow, I think this is really a, a unique way of trying to look at POD simulations. Well, one, in the CSM software development, I've briefly introduced to you, without a lot of detail, the IPARS, Integrated Parallel Reservoir Simulator, the IPAX, which does the Advanced Crack Simulator, it does the phase field, uh, these codes also include fixed stress iteration, three-way coupling, and these a posteriori error estimates. Uh, one, we have introduced here also enriched Galerkin. We've extended those results to mixed methods and also space-time discretization. So for conclusions and outlooks, uh, residual-based a posteriori error estimators that distinguish different error are derived and validated. Novel stopping criteria and dynamic mesh adaptivity is developed using the opposite error estimates. And we saw that this plays a major role not only into where we know the solution, but also when we're looking at a full compositional model. This three way coupling is an, an asynchronous coupling technique using an error indicator. The three-way coupling is developed for compositional flow and mechanics. Numerical results of field-scale carbon sequestration show that it reduces the mechanics model uptime, update time substantially by 97.5%. Some current extensions, some of this work that we're discussing here has been done for a biomedical application, multi-network poor elasticity theory. Uh, we are continuing this collaboration with Thomas Wick, Sang Hing Lee, and Mohammed Jamal, who's one of the postdocs in Shell on hydraulic fracturing. We are collaborating with Idaho National Lab on geothermal, including flow, energy, mechanics, and fracturing. And here we have added opposite error estimates and, and are currently adding phase field. We have collaboration with the University of Bergen on CO2 storage, Benmarks. There should be a couple of papers coming out on this shortly. And in one, we've had some very nice collaboration with IBM on Bayesian optimization and carbon storage. So one, what we want to do is to investigate CO2 storage and fracture propagation software using this DOE MOOSE framework. It has certain capabilities that our software does not have, but we want to use realistic field and laboratory data sets. We've extended this iterative coupling to mix finite elements for flow and with opposite error estimates. Uh, we're coupling deep learning and machine learning for optimization and validations and IPARs and IPACs comparing with uh, genetic algorithms, EMKF and UTOP. And we are wanting to look at how can we extend these results to investigate hydrogen storage models. With that, I thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer questions. Okay, this one says in the video in which you showed three fractures propagating at the same time, how would non-simultaneous initiation of these three fractures impact the result of fracture geometry provided all fractures are induced from the same fluid? So is there an efficient non-phenological method for computationally modeling this? If you know, uh, one, uh, let me say that we could try this model. I mean, in other words, uh, uh, we've done many more than three. We've done five or six or whatever. Uh, and uh, but anyway, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, certainly would be interesting to investigate uh, certain facts with regard to where the location of the fractures and according to certain physics that need to be added. 
uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge in subsurface computational modeling for the following generation? Uh, well, I think this question of many people think that we can use machine learning to solve all these problems, and I think you can't. I think you have to have the, it's important, machine learning, data analytics is important, but adding the right physics, trying to uh, satisfy uh, the, uh, how you combine this in a meaningful fashion. Uh, I think it is, uh, that is going to be how are, how are we going to go to the next stage? Uh, how are we going to we need to be adding more physics and chemistry? And that's what we're attempting to do is that you're going to have to be clever. You're going to have to be clever. And in fact, in some of these concepts, the opistory error estimates and three way coupling should also provide some insight in how one might try to apply this to machine learning. Another one says, what are what future additions to IPARs do you have? Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, it, to me, it's a code that's been developed over many years, and uh, uh, it's not clear uh, where, what for future funding, what directions need to be, uh, and if any, what should be done. Uh, we would uh, welcome any uh, suggestions. What are the unique challenges in geothermal with respect to coupled flow and geomechanics? Uh, I think there are a lot of unique uh, challenges. One, uh, we have uh, managed to move some of the software that we have developed in IPARs and IPACs to MOOCs, which has really been developed for geothermal. And uh, I think hopefully in this work, we will find out what are some of these challenges because clearly, uh, one, the some of the tools, like for example, most of the flow part done in Moose is con conforming the lurking, which is not conservative. And I'm a strong believer that you have to have con conservation for both flow and transport. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and I uh, appreciate your interest and hopefully you got something out of all of this. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mary. What a, um, that was a wonderful talk and um, I appreciate your taking time with us today and I appreciate all the attendees and the excellent questions you have. So uh, we will be posting this on YouTube. So please share it with your colleagues um, that may be interested. And if you have any follow-up questions, please uh, contact Mary or myself.